12.05 in the afternoon here on 90.3 FM. And it's Wednesday, of course, and time for Helping Seniors of Brevard. Jennifer Helen is in today for Carrie Fink. Jennifer, everybody seems to like that music. Everybody starts to dance when we start that music. There was a little dancing over here on this side. It's, it's very catchy. It is. It is. But uh, nice to have you here with us today. And you've got some interesting guests. I do. I do. So thank you for that. And, you know, welcome to the Helping Seniors uh, radio show today. On behalf of Joe Steckler, our president, Carrie Fink, our executive director, and Nancy Deerdorf, our operational uh, director, uh, welcome to Helping Seniors Radio, where we really try to focus in on helping our seniors and, and helping them get the resources that they need um, in order to stay safe. And uh, we've got some people that are keeping us safe here in the studio, and we're going to get right to them. We'll talk a little bit about the the car raffle towards the end, of course, um, but we want to jump right into it because we've got a lot of great information here. Um, um, joining us today are Corporals Martinez and Corporal Jennings from the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. Welcome. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, they are here in the background. You may or may not hear Joe Downs. Uh, Joe Downs is the also with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office, but also the president of Brevard County Triad. And the, the Tri and Triad is the state attorney's office, the sheriff's office, and the local police, along with concerned citizens and businesses trying to promote safety for our seniors. And, and that's why Corporal Martinez and, and Corporal Jennings are, are here today to talk a little bit about some of the programs uh, through Triad and through the sheriff's office that are available to seniors that people often don't know about, and also about some of the fraud, uh, identity theft, things that happen, especially within the senior community, because unfortunately, uh, they're, they're good targets, and we have a lot of folks here in Brevard County that are, well, one one out of two are 50 and over in Brevard County. So a lot of us uh, who are, by AARP definition, seniors. Um, so you know they're going to talk about some of those scams, some of the frauds that they're seeing, uh, because the more you know, uh, the better prepared that you'll be. So I'd like to start with identity theft. Um, a lot of seniors think, well, I'm not online, so that's not an issue for me. Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah, so identity theft is, um, you know, one of the fastest growing crimes. When you think about the, uh, the payoff to, um, the, the payoff to crime versus the, the uh, if, if you were to get caught, um, how much jail time you would do, right? Versus what you could get away with, uh, with the, uh, with identity theft. Um, you're looking at uh, a pretty good trade-off, really, for the bad guy, right? I can, I can take your identity. I can pretend I'm you. I can go and clear out your bank account, get somewhere between five, ten, twenty thousand dollars. And by the time anyone realizes that I've done that, I could be gone, or I could even do that from from another place. It could be out of state. It could be out of the country. Um, versus trying to go to a bank, you know, trying to go in there and convincing the staff to give give me an average of maybe three thousand dollars. And it has a bag with the with the tracker on it and the exploding die. There's a lot of risk there. And then I'm looking to possibly face 10 years, 20 years in prison. Um, so the trade-off, the incentive for someone to want to try identity theft is really there. Um, it's one of the fastest growing crimes out there. So that that's kind of scary. So the the potential is there for the bad guy to make a lot of money quickly sure. and not get caught. Yeah. Yeah. So of identity theft here in the county, what have you been seeing? Is there a, is there a trend um, or, or anything that kind of stands out to you um, within our county that people should be on the lookout for? Yeah, uh, really what they're looking to do is take advantage of, of people's desire to want to help other people, right? Um, you'll see a scammer or a person who's trying to take something from you um, try to get you emotionally involved in what they're in. They can either send you an email, make a phone call, or even an in-person contact. And one of the things they do is to put you on, under some sort of pressure. Uh, for example, you get an email that says, a uh, warning, you know, your account balance is now zero, or act now, um, almost almost like mm -hmm. a sales ad. It's kind of funny to say that. Um, but it's something that gives you a little bit of pressure that um, forces you to want to act. So that's one of the things that we're seeing with the, with the identity theft. So 
one of the as things that we as often, as you know, tell our seniors um, is is to wait. You know, take a take a beat, wait for a second, and then um, go directly to the bank, directly to your Netflix account, whatever that case may be. Um, do you have any other recommendations for for our seniors when they think or or you know? Sadly, sometimes they don't even realize that that email um, or that text message is a scam. So do you have any recommendations for people to, to be able to spot that? And you know, what should they do um, if they think they have been scammed? So on the, on the first part of that, when you are evaluating uh, correspondence from someone, whether it's an email, a letter, or even someone in person, you have to look really closely at where that information came from and then the contents of that particular email. You want to look at things like grammar. You want to look at things that are uh, addressed to the generic. For example, instead of addressing you by name, you may see something that says, Dear Customer. Um, for example, I have, I have a, a picture of one here. It's from. It looks like it's from Bank of America, and it tells you, Dear, Dear Member, and that's kind of impersonal. And it has some clues within the email um, that tell you, that this probably did not come from the Bank of America. And as you read through the email, you'll see grammatical errors. You'll see things that are written um, in a way that just isn't isn't business as usual. Um, and those are some things that you want to see as red flags. Uh, so what do you do when you get one of these emails, right? You definitely don't want to click on any of the links there. You don't want to reply. Um, if it is, in fact, your bank and you believe it is your bank that's calling you, you want to reach out to your financial institution and make sure that they are the ones, in fact, that sent that correspondence to you so that you don't end up uh, submitting your account information or any other personal information to someone who's just trying to use it for their own benefit. Very good. Very good information. So, we all, all have to be a little bit of our own detectives, don't yeah. we? Looking looking at things and making some phone calls um, before we can trust that that email or that text message um, is accurate. Now, um, you know, one of the things that we, we often work on too is fraud. And what is the difference between identity theft and fraud and where 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 it's, do you it's see really that coming it's really the same in? right so okay. so identity theft um, is is kind of the the buzzword for for what we're looking at here but it's really fraud it's an identity fraud i'm presenting myself um, as another person uh, whether it's in person or whether it's through correspondent i'm taking your information and using that as if i was you and therein lies the fraud and uh, so it's all covered under the fr same fraud statutes uh, but it's commonly called identity theft but it is actually id fraud Okay, it falls mm -hmm. all, all fall under that fraud um, aspect. So I know you know I've even been getting them um, through emails, but through um, text text messages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of a new newer thing where you're getting text messages that your packages have been delivered. Right. And I see you have an Amazon um, uh, in front of you. What is what is some of the Amazon scams out there. Yeah, so just like the the one that we're looking at here uh, is an Amazon refund notification. So if you if you've placed an order, of course, on Amazon, you could if you get this in your email or via text message, it's going to get your attention. And what they're doing, what the the fancy term for that is, uh, in in people who are trying to commit frauds is phishing. So if you think about it, if you're phishing, you throw you know the bait out there, you hope that the fish bites. What they're doing is that if let's say hypothetically they did have some sort of access to your Amazon account, um, if, if something like that had already been established and they see that you make a purchase, they think, okay, well, if I throw this bait to Jennifer, mm -hmm. then they maybe she'll fall for it. So what they're doing is they'll send an unsolicited text or email saying, hey, uh, there's a refund for you. And of course, right off the bat, that sounds appetizing basically to the customer like oh I get money back we, we don't get anything for free you know so that's interesting and um, in here as you can see or if you know of course if you're listening when you're looking at the email or the text message there will be a link there that is also trying to help you and say oh well let me just click this link let me take you back to Amazon but what's going to happen there is when you click that link it's going to take you to what appears to be Amazon but it could be basically a mirage it'll look like it's Amazon and then at that point you're putting in your login credentials and once you've opened up that portal even further, now they basically have a door to walk through. So they, they make it appetizing for us to click. Mm -hmm. um, and they're using something like Amazon where, especially you know after the last couple of years, a lot of people have ordered through Amazon. So they're, t they're kind of betting that out of all of the emails they send, at least a few people will absolutely have ordered Amazon and probably recently and be willing to click on that link. Absolutely, absolutely. 
So I, I have heard a lot of phone calls, Medicare scams um, with CVS, Walgreens. It's not really CVS or Walgreens, but you know, if your prescription is ready, chances are you're probably going to be with one of those big you know, uh, pharmacies, CVS, Walgreens, maybe even Walmart. Um, so it's just an opportunity for them to catch a few people in that net. Yeah. And if you don't mind me kind of piggybacking off of that, uh, if you, if you do have a service like that, where you're picking up, uh, pharmaceuticals and whatnot, if you have a company or, or anything like that, that's calling you and saying, hi, your prescription's ready for pickup. Oftentimes on the keypad, it'll say press one to reschedule or press one to I'm going to pick it up, whatever the, the phone tree might be. Um, the, you, you oftentimes, you know, when you call something and they say, oh, you can press one or say yes to continue. You're familiar with that. Right. Kind of, we see that a lot with things. Um, you want to be cautious of saying yes or saying no, because oftentimes if that call is not legitimate, they're recording you. So they're recording your voice so that they have you saying yes or no, so that if they do proceed to your banking institution, they have your voice authentication to proceed. So if, if of course, if, if you're a female and you have, you know, a male is calling to say yes, that two-factor authentication might not go through. But now they have the best part, they have your voice saying yes or no, and they can use your own voice against you to access your own bank account. Which is kind of scary. So what should we, what should we say from now yeah. on, correct? Uh, I, if, if, if there's the option of pressing one or saying yes, I would just press one. Gotcha. I would, they're not going to monitor the keystroke necessarily on the phone at that level. Yeah. And it's also important to keep in mind where the call originally came from. Is it a call that you received or is it a, this is a call that you made, right? If, I, if I'm trying to call my bank and my bank has an automated system um, and I frequently call my bank, I know it's the right number and that's something that I initiated, uh, then I can feel fairly confident that that would be an okay interaction. But if I get a suspicious call as someone that I may think is posing as my bank and there's an automated system that is trying to get information out of me, uh, then that's something I would be very suspicious of and I, I would just hang up. So be very suspicious of those incoming calls. Correct. Especially if they're unsolicited. The word mm -hmm. unsolicited is what you're really looking for. If you've had no contact with them or you're not expecting it, if you haven't sought that response from a company, be wary. Absolutely. Very yes. good advice. Very good advice. So one of the other things that um, Brevard Triad has recommended is the safety for the home. You know, making sure that when our, our seniors are at home, they are actually safe. And the sheriff's program does have a, uh, a home survey that they can go out and do for seniors. Um, who would like to talk to, about that with us? Yeah, let's just have a conversation. Yeah, about let's it. talk it's about the best it. Best okay. way to do it. We actually uh, did one earlier today. Um, so a home security survey is uh, something that's provided by the sheriff's office, and uh, we come out to your home and we evaluate uh, just its overall security. Uh, we look at your doors, we look at your windows, your lighting, your landscaping. There are some things about a home that, if done correctly, can help deter crime. Right. So those are the things that we're looking to implement into each home that we evaluate. And uh, there's some examples of, of some of the things that we have here. Um, for example, the door lock. Talk about the, the depth of the throw in a, in a deadbolt. So when we go out, if we're, when we're looking at your doors, we're looking for that minimum one inch throw bolt and whether or not it's working properly. And I do want to say that when we, when we come out to people's homes, some people are you know hesitant, like, oh, no, my house isn't perfectly organized or it's not one of the newer houses that's it's a of course it's a non-judgmental environment and I often encourage people that when they want to do it it's that we kind of see the when you're you're the homeowner you can't see the forest for the trees so it's more like you would maybe you might overlook how your landscaping is like he mentioned a moment ago and if it's too you're focused on having beautiful lush rose bushes and whatnot if if it's too inviting to somebody to hide there then you're working against yourself so it's almost unfortunate that we want to have these kind of things but you look at it and appreciate oh it's, it's a beautiful rose bush but then we see it as maybe a security threat so really looking at it through the professional's eyes yes um, versus us as as the homeowner who kind of gets used to that day-to-day like you said, the shrubbery or how things are around the house, right. kind of having that third party, but expert eye coming in and looking to make sure that, you know, inside and out, it is a safe place. Mm -hmm. yep, exactly. and, and some things that you normally, you normally don't think about, like are your house numbers, you know, clearly visible from the street? Um, how often do you, do you actually look at that and see it's very useful for law enforcement? And, and that's yes, a problem in my neighborhood. I'm, I yeah. live in a brand new community, but the numbers are not situated so that they're they're lit 
And so I, I know at nighttime, mm -hmm. if I have friends coming over to visit, they have a hard time finding the house. Oh, wow. So if they're having a hard time finding the house, then, you know, God forbid I have to call the paramedics out, they're not going to be able to find it either. Right. So one of the things that we consider with, with lighting, that of course that's on our list here, we, we ask basically, are the lights equipped with dusk to dawn? timers basically are there motion sensors um and we we don't we don't only consider just the exterior front uh exterior lighting but also some interior lighting you know if you have maybe kind of indicate that somebody's home depending on how home or how often your home um not just the front but also the back of your residence because that tends to be a, a relatively popular location of point of entries on burglaries mm -hmm. from personal experience i've seen that probably more often than i've seen uh, front door or front window entry Another thing we talk about, too, uh, is uh, camera systems. And, you know, it used to be they were very expensive, uh, but now they're they're very affordable. And there's actually uh, some advances in the technology there where you can get a combination camera and light bulb and motion sensor all in mm -hmm. one product. Right? Oh, wow. So out front of your garage, typically there's, there's two lights out there that light up either side of the garage in, in a typical home. You could actually just simply unscrew the light bulb and reinstall a security-based light bulb that has all these features in it uh, for a fraction of the price of what you think it would cost. So it's pretty neat. Excellent, mm -hmm. excellent. I know one, one thing that at, at my house I'm really not happy with is um, I've always had a side light or a way to look out the door to mm -hmm. know who is at my front door and the way that the house is now – I can't see who's out there. There's no peephole. There's no side light. There's no way even for me to go around to the side window and see who is at my front door. And that's exactly one of the things that we're looking for. We make recommendations for um, like the peephole. I know that you don't probably think about peepholes too much, but believe it or not, they've actually advanced themselves. Whereas, uh, you know, not necessarily the old homes, but basically the standard people, you have to walk up. Like if you're walking up to your front door to see who's outside, you have to walk up relatively close and put your face against the door. They've come as far now where they're they're very large, like in diameter, they're five or six inches so that you could stand a good distance back away from your door and be able to see who's standing at the front door while the person on the other side obviously still can't see in and their side is much smaller. So that's one of the things also that we look at and make recommendations for. Very good. Mm -hmm. And those cameras would, would yeah. solve that problem as well. Yeah. Oh, and absolutely. then something to think about too, it's it's not just the front door. Uh, if you think about the door that leads from your house into the, the garage. garage, if you're someone who leaves the garage door open fairly often, that door is like a front door. So if we don't treat it with the same uh, security measures that we would treat a front door, for example, a deadbolt a peephole, right? These are the things that you want on an exterior door. That door, although it feels like it's inside your house, truly should be treated like an exterior door. So a lot of great things that you're looking at. And, and what is the cost for this? Absolutely zero. Free. There you go. <laughs> so so no reason not to do it. And a judgment-free zone, as you said. Absolutely. So if someone is maybe hasn't trimmed the bushes or um, you know hasn't, hasn't tidied up the house, go ahead and call because it is a great service that the... Uh, sheriff's office provides can you what where should they who can they contact to, to take advantage of that yeah so you'd be contacting us here at Brevard County Sheriff's Office at the Crime Prevention Unit and uh, you can contact us through our phone number the 321-264-7755 uh, you can also visit us at brevardsheriff.com where there's uh, just the same information that we just explained to you is in written format that you can check out and you'll be looking under the crime prevention programs section crime prevention programs and there like I said you'll find a summary again of uh, what we offer and there's a link there provided that you can uh find our phone number and our exact contact information uh, even further and we can put you on the schedule. Excellent. Oh, idea. and can I also add too, it doesn't matter if you live within the city limits or not, anywhere in Brevard County and you're covered. You just read my mind. That's, Perfect. That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> because, yes, if you're in Barefoot Bay or, or anywhere else in the county, you can you can have this. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Give us a shout. And Very that, good. The, Very that good. home security survey is too, not just for the home. We also extend that uh, service to churches and to businesses. So if you have a business or a church that you want to get the same recommendations for, we can absolutely do that as well. So that's great because I know a lot of, uh, sadly, you know, a lot of businesses and churches have been going through some active shooter trainings and, mm -hmm. and different things in order to protect themselves and yeah, their, yeah. and exactly. uh, you know the the clients or congregants that that go there. So, mm -hmm. um, what a great service yeah. by the the sheriff's office. That, to that's be able another to one of our, our programs of too at the bar, at the um, uh, sheriff's office crime prevention uh, is is a program called the Four A's of Survival. So if you have a group, um, it could be a group of like like a um, homeowners association group or a neighborhood watch group or even a church group if you want to uh, get some realistic um, conversation going about the active shooter scenario we can do that for you as well mm -hmm. 
Very good. Very good. We, you know, it's something that we don't want to think about, but unfortunately in the society that we're in, uh, we do need to be aware of our surroundings and we do, do need to um, have a plan in place. Yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. It needs to be talked about. Absolutely. Are there any other programs that we haven't mentioned that you uh, would like to talk about? Uh, one of the ones that, that's actually most popular and I think goes hand in hand with our um, home security survey is is just the neighborhood watch. Um, I know it seems like, uh, you know, I, I hate to use the word old fashioned, but it is something that is alive and well here in Brevard. So if you do have a group that is interested in starting a neighborhood watch, uh, definitely give us a call at that 321-264-7755 and just let us know that you want to set that up. We'll send a member of our crime prevention team out there and we'll uh, show you how to do that. We'll show you how to get in contact with us. And then that creates a way for us to give you information to share with your neighbors. And then we can use that um, information back towards us and kind of open up that line. That's mm-hmm. very nice. Very nice. And do you, you know, because we are dealing with a lot of seniors, the, the 55 plus communities in the county, do you see a lot of them doing the neighborhood watches? Yeah, I feel like there's been quite a quite an uptick in them recently. I, I'm assuming it's because of word of mouth. Uh, but yes, people are realizing uh, nowadays that even not just our property and but there's persons crimes going on so they want to work together basically as a neighborhood and just be on the same page and I feel like again not to use the term old-fashioned but um, back in the day I feel like we knew our neighbors a lot more and now it's with a high turnover rate and people moving a lot we don't know our neighbors as much as we used to and I think the pendulum is beginning to swing back the other way now the neighbors want to be together they want to protect one another excellent very good news for that So we're going to, we're coming up on a break. Um, When we come back, we are going to continue to talk about um, Brevard County Triad and the different programs that Triad offers along with the Sheriff's Office. And we're going to talk a little bit about helping seniors of Brevard County and our upcoming fundraiser. So we'll be back soon. 1233 in the afternoon here on 90.3 FM. You're listening to Helping Seniors of Brevard. Heard every Wednesday, 12 noon to 1 o'clock. Right now, let's get back to more of the show. Carrie Fink is off today. Filling in for Carrie is Jennifer Helen. Hi, Jennifer. Hello. Yes, my name is Jennifer Helen, and um, I'm the owner of Seniors Helping Seniors. Not to be confused with Helping Seniors of Brevard County, but I do sit on the board and love to help out with them whenever I can because Helping Seniors, uh, near and dear to my heart, they run the Senior Helpline in Brevard County. Because a lot of seniors have questions, and where do they go for the resource? Well, you want to call someone that you know and trust, and that is Helping Seniors of Brevard County. Uh, You can reach Nancy Deardorff, runs that senior helpline. She is a wealth of information. You can contact her at 321-473-7770. And she will answer uh, your questions, maybe even do a little research for you. But the helpline really tries to get uh, information out to seniors in Brevard County. And that's why we're visiting today with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. They're out there every day helping keep us safe. Uh, But they're in the studio today talking about some of the different scams, frauds, uh, things that we're seeing out in the community trying to make sure that you are aware so that you can uh, prepare yourself Uh, hopefully prevent it from happening. But if it does happen, what do we do about it? And that's what we'd like to talk in this half hour about is, okay, now we've, we've accidentally clicked or we've given someone some information that we now regret and uh, we've got money missing. What do we do next? How do we report this? um, and, And how do we get our money back? So I'll I'll say first that um, we all know that we get flooded with emails or text messages of uh, a link or some attempted fraud. Um, Just clicking it and letting it take you to the website and then you realize, you know what, this might be weird. I don't like this. That in and of itself, nothing has really happened. Nothing has happened at this point. Um, They attempted to get your attention. They're basically, as the statute reads, they're scheming to defraud you. But just clicking it on its own, um, if you did call us at our non-emergency line, we would just tell you, okay, well, 
just monitor everything. Monitor your bank account. Keep an eye on it for a few days. Even those very what you're looking for in your bank account are very, very small uh, deductions, withdrawals. Like, and I'm talking like 37 cents or maybe 40 cents here and there. And what they're doing is they're testing your account to see if it works. Um, and they they don't think you're going to look for that. But um, just like I said, clicking it itself is not a reason to call us. But if you'd like to verify whether or not we believe it's fraud, you're welcome to. But don't freak out. Basically, is what I'm saying. Don't freak out think immediately you're a crime. It's not until you've put your banking number or your banking information in or some sort of uh, personal identification or if you've sent money or to that link that's told you, you have your account, your computer has been locked. You need to send $200. If you send the $200, then we're kind of in a problem. But if you're just simply getting solicited for that and you're not following through with it, just delete it, just ignore it. So don't, yeah. don't panic. Mm -hmm. And it make, make sure also you monitor your credit, whether you go with a outside service and pay them to do that or do it yourself. Um, each person is uh, entitled to a credit report once a year. And uh, from one of the three credit bureaus, either TransUnion, Experian, or Equifax. And if you stagger those throughout the year, you should get a pretty good idea of the types of things that are on your credit report. And that can be one of the ways that you can see if you've been compromised or not. So all of a sudden on your credit report, all of a sudden you have a new credit card that you have no knowledge about. That is a big red flag. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. So... The, the credit reports also, you can lock your credit, correct? So you can um, make sure that in order to apply for a loan, a new credit card, things of that nature, you have to give them permission to release that information. So that would prohibit or prevent uh, fraud from happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's ways to do that. Also with your banking institution. Um, I, I have a local uh, bank here that I use and um, every time there's a transaction on my account, I get a text message and an email. Uh, anytime there's a suspicious transaction, the bank will call me and, and even on Saturday and Sunday, they will call me, someone from the fraud department, and to ask me to verify that I'm the one making that particular transaction. Most of the time it is, so it's kind of a safety feature, but there are there have been actually three occasions uh, where someone has tried to use my banking information uh, in Tampa. And it's like, nope, I'm not in Tampa. You know what I mean? And, and I deny the... the um, you know, the transaction. So it's a really good feature and it's absolutely free. It's just something that the bank offers. So make sure that your bank does offer those services because that is a great service. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we, we have worked together uh, through Triad uh, with a few clients that they were um, unfortunately the victims of identity theft um, fraud and they have lost sadly a significant amount of money. Um, what help is there for those folks? Basically, once they've lost the money is what you're asking. Right. So now the, the fraud has happened. Unfortunately, they didn't catch it. It has happened. Now what? So in, in personal experience as a patrol deputy, what, what we often see, and it's probably the worst thing that a deputy or police officer will tell you is, we're sorry, there's nothing we can do. So once they're, that, that's why in crime prevention, that's our goal, is we're preventing you from falling for this scam. They're going to use greed, fear, curiosity. They're going to try to be your friend. They're going to do everything they can to get you to fall for it. Once you fall for it, once you send your money over to whatever this this destination is that they're trying to get the money from um typically not all the time but more often than not these locations are overseas so once that money is transferred from your respective account to this unknown account it's often overseas the ability for the sheriff's office uh, to, to prosecute is just not there. It's just impossible to uh, to prosecute. So it, it, what I've seen is we've referred people back to their banking institution. More often than not, the banking institution is able to uh, restore funds. At what cost? I don't know. I haven't seen the investigative side of it, but the simple answer is that once that money is gone, it is oftentimes gone. Which is pretty scary when you're a senior who's working, you know, living on a fixed income, um, and why it's so important to prevent this from happening in the first place. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you have um, a card that you debt that you uh, that use that you use frequently, that is a debit card 
for example, to get gas, or it's a card that directly takes your funds out of your checking or savings account, I would recommend switching um, to a different uh, card, maybe a credit card, if that makes sense. You're using um, a your credit card instead yeah, of that instead debit of card. that. A lot of times with the credit cards, if there is a scam or fraud, um, if there's charges that are disputed or that have been um, stolen, that, that's something that y you won't necessarily have to worry about covering, if that makes sense. Um, but if some money is taken out of your savings or your checking account, it's going to be very difficult to get that stuff back. So be very cautious with how you use those debit card features. Could I share a quick story? Mm -hmm. Actually, it's, it's kind of interesting. And I'm, I'm really big on the, the real life stuff. Over this weekend, Saturday, I attempted to make a purchase. And Looking at the website, everything seemed legit and whatnot. And I'm not saying that it wasn't legit, but after I attempted to make the purchase, it told me that my card was declined. And knowing that there's there was obviously enough money on the account, it's a very cheap purchase. Um, my phone started blowing up saying uh, at the same time that I got the the, the charge was saying, no, it's not going to go through. My phone, I, I use Space Coast Credit Union, and I was getting a bunch of texts from them saying, hey, this transaction has been blocked. Can you confirm whether or not it's fraudulent? So I know I'm trying to make a purchase and I received the text. So to me, that was almost solicited. I'm like, and I trust, I've, I've been with that particular credit union for a while. So I looked into it and I accidentally said that it was fraud. So now I'm getting a phone call from a real person on a Saturday afternoon and the sweetest lady in the world. And she explained to me what was going on. And I said, honey, I'm so sorry. I, I, it's not fraud. I was attempting to purchase something. And she just volunteering this information explained to me that the hub of this purchase was in Bulgaria. So she said it, um, the way they do it is that because it, I've never purchased from Bulgaria, that was a cause for concern. So they called me and I, she and I just kind of got to chit chatting, obviously enjoying frauds. She and I like. She shared with me that um, she actually doesn't even own a, or she has her debit and credit card, but she doesn't use them. And I'm thinking, okay, she must be using cash. And she said what she recommends to anyone that's concerned, any age is afraid of being a victim of fraud. Um, she recommended a, I believe she called it a cash card. And she places uh, money on this card that's disposable. And whatever purchase she makes, she uses that cash card. So she's never actually providing her debit card or her credit card number. So if anything ever happens where that cash card was compromised, it doesn't affect her actual name, her information herself. Interesting. So she's she's basically maybe going out to like Walmart or Publix and getting exactly. a, a Visa gift card and using that for the online purchases, right. which is a great idea. Yeah. So she's never giving that number. She has one, of course, it exists, but she's not swiping it. She's not putting it into her Amazon account or anything. She never, she said that she's after working there in experience, she said she'll never ever use a debit or credit card. So I'm not discouraging anyone from necessarily using it. I still use my debit card and whatnot. But if you are very, very concerned, that is an option for you. Mm -hmm. So interesting. So, and they're very easily accessible, you know, go down to Walmart, uh, CVS, um, and, and pick up that gift card. Yep. Yeah. To, and to that's reuse. something that should be done. Um, if you initiate it. Now, I'll tell you, a lot of the frauds and scams there you go. end with you going to a store, buying a gift card for someone else. Which, get, yeah. yes. And I, I recently um, went and purchased some gift cards uh, for the business. We like to do little $10 thank you gift cards for our caregivers. So I was buying them in bulk and um, I had to sign yeah. at CVS. Oh, no yeah. way, really? Yes, which I was really happy to see. I had to sign an acknowledgement that this was not a fraud, that you, they had some wording there that, hey, if this, if this, 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 and this is happening, this could be fraud and you right. should not be purchasing these gift right. cards. Wow. Right. So right. I was really happy to see that, that they're now training their employees to be on the lookout for people coming in and buying yeah. gift cards in bulk um, and to try you, to prevent that fraud from yeah, happening. And, and we were talking That's on awesome. the break about local trends. That is a local trend. Uh, we get call after call after call for uh, folks going into convenience stores or to, to big chain stores and buying gift cards as a result of feeling pressure or being frauded. Right. Exactly. So um, as part of our prevention efforts, I've, I've personally stood in front of a store watching people come in and telling them, no, you, you are in the current uh, process of being frauded. Do not buy this gift card. This is what's happening. And, you know, these frauds are designed to put you under pressure. They may tell you that a loved one is, is being held against their will and you have to provide these these gift cards to let them out. That's all 100 percent fraud. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and no one, no legitimate company, government agency is going to ask you 
to pay in a gift card. Never. Correct. Absolutely. And and one thing I do want to highlight here or, or make sure that our listeners realize is that um, this this can't happen to me. Mm. You know, that we all feel like we're invincible and, and this can't happen to me and I'm smart enough to spot these things. But the people that are committing these frauds are good. Oh, they're they're very, very good at what they do. They're very good at knowing the hot buttons to push. Yes. Um, I, we did have a, a kind of a friend of a friend who got hit by the grandparent scam. And the sad part is she didn't, she wasn't grandma. She had a very unique grandma name and they knew it. Mm. So they're, they're excellent at what they do. Yeah. Um, in order to get us to, to part with our funds, um, I had a business friend a couple of months ago who was scammed. Very, very intelligent woman, a doctor. Oh, wow. Very intelligent woman. But they did it in such a way that it was very reasonable for her to uh, go ahead and, and make a purchase. And unfortunately, it was it was a scam. So these, these people are very good. It, you, it, I want to think that it can't happen to me, but we all need to be very aware um, and and on the lookout for these things. Yeah. And if I can add to that grandparent scam, uh, I, I know that I've obviously spoken to a lot of seniors who are uh, grandmas and grandpas and they receive that call that, Oh, your grandson, Joey has been in a car crash. And then they, of course they, you know, that's where they get that your heart. They're going after your heart to get you to fall for it. Um, what I like to encourage uh, my senior community with is, um, and not picking on my, my mom or my grandma is they have Facebook. I personally don't have Facebook, but that's where my family communicates the most being spread out across the country. They uh, post pictures of their grandchildren and share details about their family. So if you do that and you receive a phone call from someone who says, Hey, little Joey's been in a car crash obviously at that point, vet it out however you'd like, determine whether or not this is legitimate, but understand that you ask yourself, have I talked about Joey on Facebook? Have I talked about where my Joey is in Costa Rica on vacation? Have I introduced that to the online community? Because like you said, these fraudsters are good. They will go to your social media page, basically do research and study you and get to know your family so that when they try to fraud you, they're almost speaking fluently about your relatives. So that's just one more thing to ask yourself, what am I exposing where they could use it against me? Absolutely. It's very unfortunate. Very, very unfortunate. So, uh, We've just got a few minutes left. I know there was a couple programs that they, they've got a sheet here and they highlighted a few things. So be, before we end, I, I want to give you the opportunity to talk about a few more of those programs at the sheriff's office. Yeah, I would say that um, just considering we have one tomorrow, so it comes out uh, right to the front of my mind, is our shred events that we offer uh, periodically throughout the county. Uh, throughout, or I'm sorry, well, throughout the county, but as well throughout the year. And um, tomorrow we have one that's uh, July 28th from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Uh, we're doing a shred event at the Cape Canaveral Precinct, and that's at 111 Polk Avenue. Um, and basically, if, uh, if you have a, a, a lump sum of paperwork and personal information uh, printed out that you just, maybe you're overwhelmed with, maybe your shredder burn up when you're trying to get rid of them. Bring your, uh, bring all those boxes, bring whatever you have that's holding those papers. And you come to that shred event uh, where we have a truck on site through a paper shredding company and the, uh, your papers and whatnot are taken. We take them out of the vehicle for you. So don't worry about if it's too heavy or whatnot, we take care of that. And we, uh, the truck basically loads up with a paper and it shreds on site. So if you're concerned about, oh, well, is my, where are my documents going? Everything is disposed of and taken care of there um, on, on site. So Cape so. Canaveral tomorrow, bring your paperwork. And really yes. only need to keep seven years. So if it's prior to seven years, get rid of it. Go ahead and, and clean out the files, bring them over. You know that they're going to be safely disposed of. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. And we have a lot of people that have had uh, relatives pass away and whatnot, and they're like, oh, no, it's cleaning out the homes maybe, and they're, they realize all that's there. So it's a good opportunity to get rid of everything in one shot. Very mm -hmm. nice. That's a, that's a great service. Uh, so please take advantage of that. And if there are more shred events coming up, where are they going to be posted? You can uh, see all of them posted at brevardsheriff.com. And that's under, again, our crime prevention programs. Um, if you don't have access to the internet or something's going on and you feel more comfortable to speak with a live person, you can call our office. Again, that's 321-264-7755. Excellent, excellent. So, just a few more minutes. Any, any one last thing. So, another one that that is interesting is our hearing impaired traffic card. 
so if you are uh, someone who doesn't hear well, or, or maybe not even at all, how do you have a conversation on the side of the road with an officer who may have pulled you over, right? Is there any resource available for that? And there is. Uh, so the Brevard County Sheriff's Office has this hearing impaired traffic stop card, and the card has pictures on it that both the officer and the driver can point to to navigate the, uh, the ins and outs of a traffic stop. For example, asking for a license, registration, proof of insurance, why, why you would stop me. Um, all these things are on this card, and it really helps helps the, uh, the communication between the, the folks that can't hear and maybe the officer on the side of the road. So excellent, excellent opportunity to mm -hmm. prevent something. <laughs> yeah. Again, keeping, keeping all of our residents safe. Mm -hmm. um, also want to mention Project Lifesaver, Brevard Triad, um, through the help of the Brevard County Sheriff's Office, uh, provides Project Lifesaver. So if, if you have someone who... Um, is unable to uh, tell you, you know, who they are or where they belong. Uh, could be a senior with dementia or it could be a young person um, with an exceptionality. Uh, Project Lifesaver can attach a bracelet to that person and uh, should they wander, they will find them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think the recovery weight rate on the Project Lifesaver is 100%. So we've never 100%. lost anyone. Yeah. Right. It doesn't yes. work on your typical uh, GPS technology. It works on radio frequencies. So we can find folks who are, uh, you know, basically anywhere, uh, anywhere in the county. They have receivers that attach to the helicopter. And y Brevard is unique in that it's, it's skinny. You know what I mean? So Long if you get, skinny, yeah, right? you exactly. can get to, if you get a helicopter on the south end of the county, you can, you can go all the way up to the north end of the county and cover most of Brevard. And I think the average recovery time is about, uh, 20 minutes so which is amazing so yeah. you don't have to be panicking wondering where your loved one went and and being in the senior industry you know i know oh we have someone with dementia mm -hmm. they're not going to wander but it's amazing how far and how fast they can get away when they want to and just because someone does have dementia doesn't mean that they're not capable so making sure that you've got your bases covered you've got your plans you've got you know trusted caregivers involved um, but that you also have that bracelet is really, really invaluable. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. Absolutely. Well, before we go, I just want to mention one more time that the Helping Seniors of Brevard County fundraiser is in full swing right now. We are coming up to our grand raffle um, in October. I hope, hope you guys will be able to join us. We'll be um, uh, raffling off one of four brand new cars uh, the Kia Sportage, the Mazda Miata, the Chevy Camaro, and of course my favorite as, as captain of Team Dodge, the Dodge Challenger. We'll be uh, going out to do the Dodge versus Chevy Challenge pretty soon, so be on the lookout for that. That's, that'll be a lot of fun, and you can vote to see who, you know, who, who won Dodge versus Chevy. Uh, you can make sure that you pick up your tickets uh, you can contact Nancy at the office, 321-473-7770. Uh, uh, she can answer any senior-related questions you have, but you can also purchase tickets. Uh, it is a $25 donation for one ticket, or you can get five tickets for a $100 donation, and all of that uh, goes towards helping us keep that senior helpline afloat um, and making sure that we can be here on the radio and share all of this wonderful information. And before we go, can, can you give us your number? How do we contact you here at the crime prevention um, at the Brevard County Sheriff's Office? Yes, yeah, so I, we've said that number a few times, and it's, uh, that is actually our number. And that number, again, is 321 264 Seven seven five five. Any of the programs that we talked about to include Project Lifesaver. Uh, any further information about those programs or hosting them can be found at that number. Super. And again, contact Nancy at the Seniors Helping Seniors Helpline at three two one four seven three seven 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 zero. Again, my name is Jennifer Helen. I'm the owner of Seniors Helping Seniors, where we really do hire seniors to go out and help seniors. We're always looking for seniors who would. Uh, like a part-time job that they would absolutely love to have um, and seniors that need a little bit of help and I can be reached at 321-722-2999. On behalf of all of us um, at Helping Seniors of Brevard County, thank you for being with us today. I want to thank you, uh, thank our guests, uh, Corporal Martinez, Corporal Jennings, and, and kind of behind the scenes, uh, scenes uh, Joseph Downs. Thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate your help. 
Thank you. Yes, and thank I, you. I, I just got the five minute mark. I was looking at the clock and I think my clock is a little bit fast. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're looking at me across the, saying, no, no, no. <laughs> we still have five minutes left. We have five minutes. So we have five minutes to play. Um, so since we're, we're just going to play a little bit, Chevy. Dodge versus Chevy, Chevy Camaro versus Dodge Challenger. Can I get you on record? Ooh. Okay. Ooh. So what if I told you I drove a GMC? <laughs> But uh, well, I'm gonna well, forgive to, me for that. I'm gonna have to go with Chevy. <laughs> go with, oh Chevy. I'm, I'm a Chevy girl. My grandparents are retired Chevrolet folks. Uh huh. So okay. Yeah, yeah. So we've we've got to vote for the Chevy. Uh, well, you, I'll sir. be honest with you. In, in my mind, uh, you know, as a as a police officer for 20 years, the one and only vehicle that will be my favorite for my entire uh, life and career is the Ford Crown Victoria. Absolutely. Oh, Hands the, down. So he's vintage. The perfect police car. <laughs> there you go. go oh, going you're back talking to about Ford. police cars. Well, no, actually, we. Um, oh. So the the uh, car raffle is our our annual fundraiser, and the winner gets to choose which car. Oh wow! So they have four to choose from: the Miata, the Camaro, the Challenger, and the Kia. So you oh. get to choose. So if if you were the, the grand prize winner, which car would you choose out of those four? I would go oh, for the Camaro. The Camaro. All day. I oh, I all right. So they're both fired now as Team Dodge oh. captain. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure while it lasted. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we're going to say goodbye. <laughs> Have a great afternoon.